Millie the White House dog. Speaking Speaking of. This gets awake for the podcast. I think this is a a historic first. I know. Good to see you, Basquack. (laughs) Basquack, what do you have to add to this? Nothing. You have nothing to add. (laughs) Okay. Just panting. Just chill over there. I know it's nice and cold in that house. I don't know what she's panting about. (laughs) Well, it is a a little warmer up here, Jordan. Yeah? Up in the studio. In the in the stew, as we say. Stew. Jen's hopping in as Jen. What is going on? Oh my god, calm down. It's 958. It's not 10. Calm down. No, I'm talking about the fact that you're the fact that you're logging in is your own name. This is oh, <laughs> I know that sucks. <laughs> you did that by accident, didn't you? Yeah, I sure yeah, did. I knew there it. We go. Welcome to Wednesday <laughs> Warehouse. It's our segment on Beernet Radio where we go over the week's news. I have with me Jen Litz Kirk and Jordan Driggers. Guys, big week. I would say probably the biggest thing uh, was the uh, Anheuser Busch wholesalers really kind of. Feeling their oats. It's been a year since the Mulvaney thing. They've gotten just hammered. And then they've got some relief from the brewery and since for case. And now the brewery wants, they want them to work for it. And it's it's going to be rough. And we did talk about this. It was over a month ago um, on the podcast. And then we got, uh, spent the next few weeks kind of gathering information just to make sure our facts are right. But I wanted to read a quick email that I got from a wholesaler yesterday after the story ran that I thought was very thoughtful. He says, one of the wisest things August Bush III did was to ensure that state and regional sales management had significant street experience. Mm -hmm. An MBA is a wonderful analytical background, but charts and graphs not viewed through the prism of street experience creates a significant communication gap. This communication gap is large and responsible for resentment on both sides. A major reason for the popularity of the most recent SAMCOM was the absence of complex Excel spreadsheets and graphs that were incomprehensible explanations on 10-second audience viewing that were viewed as obvious gospel by the presenter. And I think that kind of underlines what's going on here. It really is a communications problem. Some of the sentiment was like, oh, the rural wholesalers, they're too dumb to get it. Like they're, you know, they're not sophisticated. And no, it's a communication problem. When I first started getting inklings of this from the field, it was more of we focused on the wrong things because they told us to focus on that. And then they changed the plan afterwards. So there's obviously a communication breakdown with certain regions. And so... Jen, you uh, you did some great reporting on this subject. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the crux of the whole disjuncture or disjunction, whatever, between the wholesalers and AB is exactly like the idea that you've got these MBAs in the high tower and then, you know, they don't know how, who are they to kind of retool account types by data? Like they don't know what account types are best and we do, right? So that's the higher level, but, you know, just on the ground, we talked to, um, quite a, quite a few wholesalers. You know, I talked to more than 10, Harry talked to more than 10. We had some right in, um, you know, there was a big contingency of wholesalers who responded to our survey and almost to a wholesaler, except for the wholesaler panelists who wrote in after the story ran, um, almost to a wholesaler. It was like, Some of these standards are ridiculous. There's a hundred percent benchmark for call frequency, right? But, but we don't really know what we're being held to because, you know, we're hearing it's like 90%, but then it can also depend on your commercial director and all of this stuff. And then, so the point about uh, the rural wholesalers, the other thing about the rural wholesalers is the fact that this all centers on this M360, which is AB's tech platform where these Wholesalers have to log everything, right? They have to go into an account, start start your call, and then when they end, they have to end their call. But let's say there's a technical glitch, you lose connectivity or whatever, then the call doesn't get logged and you get docked, right? And so this is more right. of an issue theoretically in rural areas where maybe connectivity is not as good. 
Now, AB has some workarounds around this, but the whole point is there's this gap between uh, of empathy, even it seems like between right. AB holding their wholesalers to theoretically a hundred percent standard, um, you know, and and it's just it, the lack of communication again. Yes, that's what it seems like. Yeah. Some standards I understand were changed at the end of last year, so there is some change. Um, and then again, after we wrote this piece. Uh, and and by the way, some wholesalers estimated that like 70 to 80 percent of the system is currently out of compliance. AB in their statement to us denies that they said the majority are in compliance. But some say that, you know, that's kind of here nor there, because at any given time you could be taken out of compliance, not just during assessment. But, um, you know, it's some people that you would not expect to be out of compliance are out of compliance. There's some pretty big yeah. names that have been out of compliance. Right. And so what does that tell you? I mean, so anyway, um, and then after the story ran, some whole said, Sarah Matesic Swab, you know, wrote in and, and spoke, we spoke and she said, you know, this is, this is, doesn't reflect my experience. Right. And, um, you know, of course we have to have standards and, um, you know, there are workarounds and we really appreciate the investment of AB in general for things like, you know, what you're seeing this summer. Um, and yeah, there's no uh, doubt AB has really stepped up their spending. Right. Right. Nobody right. can complain about that. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, on the, on the rural wholesaler thing, it, you know, there's also a case where Metro wholesalers have more pre-salesmen because of the density of the accounts and rural wholesalers rely on their drivers and merchandisers to make some of the calls. And it sounds like some of those aren't getting logged because right. maybe the driver doesn't, have, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. And maybe he's not trained. So, you know, so that was like kind of one thing Sarah said, you know, this can be a training opportunity. Right. Yeah. Um, and well, she did when, say when there's an account that's 60 miles out, you know, right. who cares? Well, yeah. <laughs> and well, that's the other thing that came, you know, the account type. So Sarah did say, and, 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 you know, some I can AB wouldn't go on the record with anything except for the statement. So I'm limited in what I can say to their side. But what I understand is overall call frequencies have been reduced because of the way that accounts have been retooled. Right. So you visit these accounts more than you used to and these accounts less. So net net, supposedly there's less that you have to actually make the call to. But um Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that freaks people out is what is AB's leverage here? And it's the, these wholesaler agreements, right? And I think the idea is, well, this is just an opportunity for us all to get into compliance because wholesalers do have the opportunity to come back and get into compliance. But on the other hand, what if some don't get back into compliance? Is this a, some wonder? I'm not saying this, but some wonder, is this some sort of tool for AB to wield, right? Right. So. And, the, and the only way they can wield it is to force a consolidation. I mean, like you, you said, I think Jordan, maybe you said this, that where are they going to go? Like yeah. if they terminate the larger ones, the yeah, larger, the larger ones. wholesalers, yeah. where are they going to go? You know, it just seems like a lot of tension. I think everybody kind of took a year, like took a beat. And I don't know if wholesalers are ready to be bossed around by AB again. Um, you know, they're like, this was all you're doing. And now you're going to come in and tell us what to do. And AB is probably saying, well, we've been sitting on our hands for a year, letting you take your time trying to, you know, find new revenue streams for your business. And we've been giving you relief. And now it's been a year and we're num the numbers aren't where we want to see them yet, you know. And so I think they're finally meeting back up and hashing things out. And that's why it's been so vocal to us, because as Sarah kind of pointed out, she's like, nobody's going to be talking about this. And. 30 to 60 days, which I will we'll see, see. <laughs> but I do kind of believe her um, because I don't think AB wants to, you know, really take this to terminations or anything like that. I think it's kind of a, a wake up them finally getting back to working together and there's still some animosity for everything that's happened. Right. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is their depletions were down 14% in the mm -hmm. first quarter. To a wholesaler, you, you know, if you wanted to do the math, you could say, well, my call ratios are down 14% <laughs> because yeah. there's not enough volume going through to cover the fixed costs. And, and to a wholesaler, it's actually worse than that because the cost structure on the margin has so much more leverage. So, you know, 
if you're running at full capacity and and you have this certain call ratio set up and you delever to lower volume by 14%, that means your profits are probably going down 80% because of the way that the fixed cost structure works and the high fixed cost of running a, 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 a distributing company. So the, I mean, the irony of all of this is that all of this, not only the Mulvaney event, but also this strong arming only pushes these AB wholesalers to diversify more. It only pushes them to bring on other brands. And I will tell you, like this whole D9 thing, I mean, some people think it's a fringe. There is so much interest from beer wholesalers in getting into this D9. And there are some big AB wholesaler names getting into it. And I don't right. think that's a coincidence. One other thing that you pointed out, Harry, too, you know, depletion's down 14%, but that's not necessarily reflective in their inventory, right? right. I mean, they're still just stuffed with <laughs> with ab products and um you know it may be tough to diversify yeah uh, one wholesaler who will go nameless but i think you'll know who it is because they insist on talking to me on the phone <laughs> and it's always we'll a know. Long, we know who it is <laughs> a long time which hey, listen i love it and inventory was a huge thing for him when i was in the business and it, back in the night everybody loves it when i talk about the 90s right <laughs> okay so back in the 90s we had more inventory as an industry because freight was just slower back then. And we got a lot of inventory by rail, which now it's mostly by truck, which is faster. So we would keep 25 days on the floor, which was a lot. We usually like to keep it down to like 24, 23. And then nowadays it's more like 20, 21 days. And, you know, these wholesalers have 30 plus days on the floor. So, you know, when your sales are not picking up and you have 30 days on the floor, that just sucks all the cash out of your company. And if you're revolving on a, if you're relying on a revolving note to pay that inventory, when you're up to 30 days, the bank's just going to say no, because especially when credit, uh, credit's tightening, interest rates are higher. So there's not a lot of cash. And I think a lot of people think like particularly either new people in the industry or people outside looking in, they're like, oh, beer wholesalers are rich. You know, they're like car dealers. They, they can afford inventory. Inventory sucks up cash. When you pay for the inventory, but you haven't sold it yet, that is a huge gap. Now, one thing, beer wholesalers are lucky, or at least some of them are, in some states, they don't have accounts receivable. So at least they're not carrying debt on the other end of the inventory uh, flow to retailers. Retailers, like in Texas, retailers pay with cash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know that, that really helps. But a lot of states, 30 days, some 60 days. So if you're paying, especially if you've just acquired and you have a debt load, plus you got cash sucked out with inventory, there are wholesalers that I have specifically heard who are scrambling to work with their banks to get uh, to get, just to get cash to operate, you know, not, not a long-term loan just to operate. Mm -hmm. And that puts a stress. And, you know, and also this industry in the wholesaler tier, at least is, is not amenable to layoffs. Um, there have been a forced, a lot of layoffs this last year in the AB system. Um, but it's tough because when you work at a beer distributorship, a lot of times you work there for life. There, there's not a lot of uh, in and out, in and out. There is down in the warehouse and there is in the merchandiser level. But once you get to driver, there's a lot of people who start as a driver and end up as an area manager or, or general manager, or, you know, that's how they move up in the company. And how do you lay those people off that have been with you since they were in their early 20s? It's tough. So, you know, like I've always said, nobody leaves the beer industry. You just, you just get moved around, right? It's like it's the like, it's, it's like the government. It's yeah. like a government job. <laughs> it is like a government job. It is. Ironically. Except your hours are way more screwed up. Yeah. Your hours <laughs> yeah. suck. <laughs> yeah. Your hours really suck. You know, the great thing about the beer industry is you got to be there really early in the morning. <laughs> and leave to cover really like late. C stores and grocery stores. But, oh, but also you have to stay really late to cover the bars and restaurants. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Oh, and by the way, it's a 24 hour business. So you'll have people in the building for 24 hours because you got the warehouse people there overnight. It's great. And during COVID, you'll be a frontline worker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't get off. Be an COVID. essential you, worker. <laughs> you don't get to catch up on Netflix and chilling, you know, like we did. Yeah. Kind of. Oh, I mean, what we still have to work. 
but I'm, you know, I was happy to do it because uh, the income still came in. We're, we're very fortunate. God, if we were like beer business daily of Mexico, we would have been screwed. <laughs> right. right beer business. business el dia, los dias. Cerveza, trabajo, <laughs> todos los dias. I should really todos know how to say Your it. Spanish is lit. Jen. Oh, thank you. I thought you were going to say something else. My kids would be disappointed. They speak way better Spanish than I do. So do mine. Mine yeah. or two of mine are fluent and uh, it's really irritating because I always <laughs> pretended like I spoke Spanish when they were little. <laughs> Wait, well, okay. Like, yeah, who's I not know. fluent? Who's not fluent? Harrison is not fluent. Really? Because I yeah. that was my initial guess. But then I thought, no, he's so buttoned up. Maybe he does have another. But anyway, so. No, Hunt and Wyatt. Well, they went through an, a Spanish immersion. Okay. Uh, the public nice. school that they went to. So they're, 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 they're Spanglish fluent. They're, they're text yeah. fluent. Let's put it that way. Plus Nacho they're, Libre. Yeah. Plus, <laughs> Nacho, plus they're not, they're not speaking, you know, Spanish from Spain. They're not saying, you know, I, I'm going to Ibiza this summer. You know, they don't say shit like that. It's more like, Hey, Hey, cabron. No shit, right? <laughs> that kind of stuff. To so say Hunt's definitely going to Ibiza at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having lunch with Hunt today, and my speaking of Mexicans, my mother, who <laughs> is is really getting old. God bless oh, her. But gosh. we're gonna go pick her up at the nursing home, take her to lunch, and and she'll say just terrible things that <laughs> I can't repeat here. I'm sure. Oh. All right, so let's talk numbers. You know, in, industry is not doing great. It's not terrible, I would say, but it's also not great. I would say the only good news that we're looking at is that the wine and spirits guys are doing worse. <laughs> <laughs> they're not doing, they're not. For once. Yeah, exactly. They're doing worse right. than they were. That's for sure. They're doing worse than they were. Finally. You yeah. know what? And it's the same thing I've said before. It's because they have an inventory problem and you can't get rid of that stuff. It lasts forever, literally forever on the shelf. There's, there's bottles of wine from, from Thomas Jefferson's cellar out there. Ask Marvin Shankin. He has one. <laughs> Is it vinegar? Is it yeah? Vinegar. Well, the vinegar, billionaire's vinegar. Well, do you want to talk about our the early preview of our wholesaler yeah. survey? Yeah, yeah. That, so I haven't. I've only peeked in it, but before many people. So tell us what your first impressions are. Yeah. So top line, you know, we got about seventy wholesaler respondents, which is pretty darn good, and uh, that was covering about forty nine percent Molson Coors wholesalers and thirty eight percent AB. And then 12 identifying primarily as constellation houses, but you know, there's a lot of overlap with sure. constellation. Yeah. But you know, they're like, you know, no, 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 I'm a constellation house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, even yeah. Though, <laughs> even though they're Molson Coors or, or AB, they're like, no, no, I'm, yeah. My, I'm a gold network, baby. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure <laughs> oh, that will please. only. <laughs> Look at that. Gold uh, network. Yeah. Thanks, Release Mac. the balloons. Thanks, Steve Jobs, for adding this uh, nonsense to my professional <laughs> podcast. So professional. <laughs> Um, but you know, you're you're talking about the the numbers was a good segue because one of the major themes was, of course, concern for category health. Uh, and again, you know, we talked about higher inventories that was definitely indicated on the survey, um, often due to threat of strike and more investment in imports. So we asked this question about, you know, what segment are you investing in most? And last year at this time, of like almost half said core, which was kind of funny considering that. Mulvaney thing was in full swing at this point last year and still almost half. So they were investing the most in core and only 18% said imports. And then this year, just as many who said they were investing the most in core said they were investing the most in imports. So it was about 31%, 32% each. And then in both years, Beyond Beer was a distant third. Um, the most pressing issue in going into the second half of the year is category health, you know, as, as that name. Um, quote, health of the beer category, other concerns are basically subcategories of that from liquor as a competitive threat, specifically with their pricing versus ours, people drinking less in, in general, THC and cannabis. Uh, well, last year, the top concern was, of course, the AB Black Swan event. And there was also category health concerns, but not named that, which to me says it's a much bigger all encompassing, like we're scared of everything <laughs> that's yeah. coming at beer, right? Um, and then the strike effect, you know, we asked about the strike effects 
And for both AB and Molson Coors wholesalers, one big effect was, of course, as you said, larger or excess inventories. About 20% of those who responded to this question uh, indicated excess inventories. Another 22 or so percent said these strikes had little or no effect on their business. Um, and then another 21 or so percent have seen some level of out of stocks. This was obviously Molson Coors wholesalers. Yingling, perhaps, you know, some one offs here and there of Molson Coors SKUs. There was also, we found out through this survey, it seems to have been largely resolved, but there was a keg issue. It seems to have been coming out of Golden, Molson Coors Golden facility. And it seems like for some West Coast wholesalers, they had to pull back some kegs for some issue. Um, but it only lasted, we're hearing, a couple weeks. So that should be done by now. But that was interesting to see because we know, you know, Constellation had a keg issue last year. I don't think it's anything like that. Um, right. But we we did. Yeah, hear what that. is it with these kegs? What is supposed yeah. to be the easiest package to get out there because it's just a giant, you know, <laughs> 200 pound. Just... Yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there were, yeah, there were other highlights too, but that's kind of the top line. You know, we'll go also into pricing. 80% said they either already have or will take price this fall. 65% have already taken it. Um, and then we'll get into like top new innovations. Shocker. They mostly revolve around tea because that's all anybody put out this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Love it. Love the tea. They you gotta love the tea. Oh, you gotta love the tea. When I said, you know, the industry isn't too bad, I'm looking at volume. Mm -hmm. But, you know, unfortunately, some of, we're getting clipped at the high end in some areas and craft in particular. And and so and then, you know, we reported Jordan this morning that uh, Bush Light is doing really well. And that's great for volume. But at what expense? You know, where where is that coming from? Probably from a higher price brand. Yeah. Or Bud Light, right? I mean, I'm sure some of that's coming yeah. from Bud Light, too. Sure. Yeah, you know, in the high end, I was talking to a like boutique wine and spirits distributor um, in Austin last night, and he was showing me full cooler doors of D9 and not just like D9 drinks, but he said there was one called New Brew that's Kratom and Kava Root. And he looked at that and he's like, this is absolutely killing my wine sales. Mm -hmm. And and I think for craft and for some of the higher end for some of those you know consumers that were gravitating towards like you know one nice beer they're kind of going towards stuff like that and the d9 i, I it looked like an fmb you know convenience store door I, it was a different brand on every shelf and then it's not like i said not just d9 but other like new like mind altering uh, euphoric drinks and i think that's just the beginning and that is a little a, a wee bit scary of um this door that's about to open with you know functional let's say functional highs <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um that people can just you know crack open at any time i i think that we kind of downplayed cannabis because it was so limited to the dispensary but now that people have got this workaround on the farm bill we're actually starting to see the power of extra intoxicating canned beverages out in the market. Right. That's, and the, and the regulation has yet to catch up. Yeah. Full cooler doors of, of stuff. And yeah. he said mm -hmm. that's like where he um, does all his business now in Austin are these huge convenience stores where he'll do like 300, $400, you know, or not $400, 400 uh, SKU orders for a, a C store for one little boutique distributor full of wine and what have you. Um, so it's, it's starting to become a, a new game, I think, in these trendy areas of uh, where people are shopping, what people are buying, and the mass type of beer, especially after an event like last year, is kind of being left. But we have to say with the caveat that it could get shut down any day. In oh, any yeah. Day. I don't know that the feds are interested in that, but certainly the states have woken up to it. And it seems like there's just a lot more chatter. I don't know if you saw in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend, there was a pretty scathing article about the long-term health benefits of cannabis. And, you know, from this doctor, her name's Bertha, but I can't remember her last name. I just remember Bertha, but, you know, <laughs> she's a PhD at Harvard, pretty smart woman. And uh, she, uh, she's been kind of on a crusade that, you know, the data point, if that 
gets wider spread mainstream type of coverage, it could wake up lawmakers. I don't I don't mean to be doom and gloom because I know that there's a lot of hype around that category. I, I wouldn't take a discounted cash flow of the gross profit of those brands five years out. Mm. I, I would do it just year by year. And, and until we get some structure and figure out what is legal, I mean, and how are D9 beverages regulated vis-a-vis -vis beer? You know, I think the 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 D9 guys and girls want to, I think they want to regulate just like beer, mm -hmm. which I think it makes sense, you know, instead of like a cannabis item, which yeah. would be dispensary only. Yeah. So interesting I, stuff. I think the conundrum that wholesalers, beer wholesalers have right now is that by the time the regulation catches up, is it going to behoove me to have already picked my partner, right? Like maybe I want to have, take the hot brand out for me at this point, you know, roll the dice that the regulation will go in my favor right. versus wait, right? That's that's what I'm hearing out there. Right. Yeah. I, I think in our time covering cannabis, first movers haven't been all that, you know, rewarded um, at Constellation, um, beer distributors that have, you know, we're kind of on the forefront. I haven't really heard much about that business for them nowadays. Um, all these early cannabis brands in California and Colorado, like Dixie Elixirs and stuff. You know, I, I, I don't know of anybody that got in at the very beginning and is owning the market yeah. now. Yeah. It might be different with D9. widespread retail. Yeah. I just think it's early, super early days, right? Yeah. Like, I don't really know if Constellation is going to have played it right or not in the end, right? But point well taken, absolutely. At this point, it does not <laughs> seem to have behooved them. But I, it's funny that all of these companies are acting as though cannabis will inevitably be legalized federally. That's right. kind of how I feel. I mean, some people would disagree because, you know, there's some vertical integration and state by state stuff, right? And But it it certainly seems that way for some companies. Yeah, because I mean, what's the difference between D9 and an, and an edible that's sold in a dispensary? But the D9 folks are, you know, this is the way it's going. It's hard to put toothpaste back in the tube. It's kind of like Uber. Let's just do it and then we'll worry if it's legal later. And if enough people like it, then politically it'll be hard to resist. I think, you know, as it stands right now, there are states where there really aren't any laws on the books except plus 18. And mm -hmm. so you, you can't buy a beer but you can buy a D9 beverage if you're 19 years old. And I think that has to be cleaned up. Um, where you can sell it needs to be cleaned up. I, I think a beer license at retail makes sense, a beer and wine license, you know. And, and, and you know, the if you're a small D9 producer, now's the time to make hay because the big guys are not going to get in it. They're not going to get in it until it's legal. So they do have a window of opportunity to build brands before all the big guys dump into it. And, you know, if I know AB, they'll get into it just to ruin it. <laughs> you know, the category killer. Let's just take the cheapest, Case. shittiest brand and then just ruin the category. So, Boom. All right, guys. Well, thanks for being on and we'll catch you next week. I know you guys have a podcast later today. I'll be traveling to Chicago for Binge's deal and we'll be on the floor, in the field, covering it you guys that's what i do it's what i live for what i love hanging out with wholesalers in the bar it's because it's like it's like a finally back at home you know so all right live, guys laugh love that's harry <laughs> <laughs> living laughing and loving with harry <laughs> all right guys take care bye